The customs and beliefs of other cultures have fascinated travelers, adventurers and explorers throughout history. But this particular group of Australian Aborigines, who call themselves the Aranda people, have a special place in the story of how we, as one group of humans, have come to perceive others. For they were the subject of a study that led to a revolution in social thinking. Up until about a hundred years ago, we used to think of people like these Aranda as primitive. And it wasn't just their social and mental lives that we thought of as pretty simple. They were presumed to be living evidence of our own more primitive past, sorts of living fossils, examples of the way in which we ourselves used to exist before we evolved into a so-called higher state of civilization. At the turn of the century, the people responsible for this point of view were those involved in the spread of colonial interests. Explorers, traders, missionaries, administrators and the like were convinced of their own superiority in every respect over the natives they encountered, governed, exploited and converted. This attitude, reflected in public entertainments and travelling shows, gradually changed as the new science of anthropology examined natives in some detail. Recording biological differences tended to reinforce Victorian beliefs of racial superiority, but as anthropologists looked at social life, they found that the worlds of these people weren't at all simple or backward. In fact, they were surprisingly complex. This startling discovery led to a new respect for unfamiliar cultures, and it also changed the way we see ourselves. This series traces how that change came about by looking at the work of six pioneering anthropologists and the intriguing peoples they chose to study. Humans have a tendency to see other people's ways of life as pretty bizarre. How can they live in such places? How do they hold such apparently ridiculous beliefs? How have they developed such odd customs? We've always been interested in the way other societies are organised and we've always had pretty strong views on the subject. It's the nature of those views that anthropology has attempted to change. Anthropologists came to realise that just visiting another culture wasn't good enough and they developed a system of study which meant going, staying and then looking and listening. One of the early pioneers Walter Baldwin Spencer was very much a product of Oxford University. He'd left art school, even though he'd been a prize-winning student, because he wanted to study something more scientific. The subject he chose was biology, and it was to be his career for the rest of his life. He was a brilliant student. He left here with a first-class degree, but he had a wide range of interests outside biology. At this university, you can attend any of the lectures being given, and Spencer was especially attracted to those being given by Edward Tyler in anthropology. Tyler was the first person to hold a post in anthropology at Oxford, and he strongly influenced the young biology undergraduate. At Exeter, his old college, Spencer is today commemorated by a stained glass window. It's an honor that doesn't only reflect the fact that he became a famous biologist. He's also remembered for the contribution he made to the developing subject of anthropology. And that interest was kindled by those early lectures given by Tyler. Spencer was one of the first generation of biologists taught along the lines of Darwinian evolution. For him and his colleagues, this was the way of ordering and organizing the living world. This new concept influenced the way that Spencer tackled his first job. In 1884, he helped catalogue and rearrange the items in the famous Pitt Rivers anthropological collection. They're displayed in a way which shows how and what Victorians thought about those strange, apparently backward groups of people that they encountered on the fringes of colonial empire. Objects of similar use are grouped together to show how they developed from the simplest to the more complex. Now, this ordering illustrates a basic assumption of Spencer's day, and that was that human society everywhere had evolved. 
but that isolated cultures, like the Australian Aborigines, were living representatives of our primitive past. In fact, the, within their uh, limits, they were already a scientific people. And this uh, was really quite something that uh, the 19th century people had not realized. They thought they were uh, sav savages, uh, that they were doomed to disappear, uh, and that uh, the sooner they went, in a sense, the better. These people certainly faced extinction, but the fact that they came to be better understood had a great deal to do with Spencer's career. For in 1887, he went to Australia as professor of biology at Melbourne University. Outside these young colonial cities, with all the amenities and values of Victorian England, were vast, unexplored regions. As Spencer set up home with his young wife and organised his biology department, he was invited to join an ambitious project to survey the unknown interior. The members of the expedition were mostly scientists, funded by an Australian entrepreneur, William Horne. They were to travel on camels that had been specially imported into the Australian desert. It was early in May 1894 when we arrived at Udna Data to find everything ready for a start. It was now winter, and at that time the climate of the centre is perfect. The days are warm and the nights cold. All day long the sun shines brightly in a cloudless sky and at night the stars are brilliant in their clearness. Our daily programme when on the march was much the same day after day. We were usually up some time before sunrise. A little after sunrise we had breakfast and the camels were brought in. Each of us loaded his own and then off we started in single file. After perhaps 10 or 12 miles came the midday halt, when we were glad of any shelter afforded by the thin scrub. Mounting again, we travelled on until dusk brought us to our camping place for the night. The camels were unloaded, hobbled and set free to feed. The campfires were lighted, notes were written up, specimens labelled and packed away and then, after a final pipe, we lay down on the ground and slept in the open. Often, it was so cold that we awoke to find our water bags frozen solid. The Horn Expedition's brief was to examine and record the natural history of the area. Everything from birds and trees to rocks and insects. If you're not particularly interested in plants, trees, insects and animals, this sort of landscape can be pretty monotonous. But for a biologist like Spencer, there was enough out here that was undiscovered and unrecorded to make the Horn Expedition a fascinating trip. In studying the flora and fauna out here, he was, of course, imposing his own scientific view on this landscape. His task was to collect, classify, and eventually to understand the territory in his own biological way. But in fact, this land had been understood long before people from his own culture had ever set foot in Australia. For thousands of years, Australian Aborigines had lived in hundreds of different tribes all over the vast continent. But by the time the Horn Expedition came across the wandering bands, their numbers had been drastically reduced as Australia was colonised. Their culture has continued to suffer at the expense of white interests. But as Spencer was to discover, there was more to Aboriginal life than he first imagined. The sight was not at all an appetising one and the savages looked more like wild beasts gnawing their prey than human beings. But it was intensely interesting to us, as it was the first time on which we had really come into personal contact with the absolutely wild Australia savage. We saw him, first of all, capture his prey with his sharp-pointed wooden spear. Then, quite ignorant of metal knife, he had extracted the tendons and cut its body open with a sharp stone flake and had cooked it on a fire made by rubbing two pieces of wood a hard and a soft one on each other. We still cook the same way the old people used to cook. 
right way, you know, and cut it way, cut it right way too. Some other tribe they cut it different way, like Pinjara, Ayawa, Aranda, or Kurunji, and they cut different way. It's a very important thing to cook. You gotta cook right, right way. The carving was done by one man who, first of all, extended the original cut so that he could take out the liver and the heart, which were eaten first. Then, with the aid of a sharp digging stick, he cut the body up, very roughly indeed, into joints, using his teeth to aid him in tearing off the burnt skin, and helping himself as he went along to such dainty morsels as the kidneys. The animal was, at best, only half-cooked. Some parts were almost raw, and those who wished their portion better cooked simply rubbed it up and down in the hot ashes until it was done to his or her taste. Probably the most important outcome of the Horn expedition took place towards the end. Although several scientific discoveries had been made, the expedition is best remembered for the fact that Spencer's scientific curiosity had been aroused by Aboriginal culture. His notebooks record that he had gone into their camps to get information on their knowledge of plants and animals and to photograph them. Our campfires lighted up the rocks that hemmed in the chasm in which we were camped and shone upon the bodies of the natives. As we rolled our rugs round us on the hard ground and watched the stars shining down through the cleft in the great rock, we realised that we had been carried far back into the early history of mankind and that we had enjoyed an experience such as now falls to the lot of few white men. We had actually seen, living in their primitive state, entirely uncontaminated by contact with civilization, men who had not yet passed beyond the Paleolithic stage of culture. After ten weeks of wandering in wild Australia, the members of the expedition were back among their own people. Alice Springs Station, with its group of buildings, nestles amongst the hills by the side of the Todd River, during a good season, it is a picturesque spot, with its rocky hills of red quartzite and intervening flats covered with herbage on which the station cattle browse with great advantage. The station forms quite a little settlement in itself, with its operating room where day and night the machines are ticking ceaselessly. It wasn't until the Horn expedition arrived here, at the telegraph station in Alice Springs, that Spencer's future as an anthropologist was decided for the telegraph operator here in those days was no ordinary government official. In fact, he was a local celebrity. And although he wouldn't have known it at the time, Frank Gillen was probably the world's leading white expert on Australian Aboriginal life. Gillen Station was in the middle of Aranda Territory, and his relationship with these people was remarkable. Because he had treated them with respect, Gillen had won their confidence and been admitted to their tribe as an initiated elder. Although the main party headed for home after a few days, Spencer stayed on here in the Gillen household as a guest for three weeks. Every day, the local Aranda people brought him all sorts of biological specimens, which interested and impressed him. But it also gave him a chance to take a longer look at their culture and to benefit from Gillen's extensive knowledge of things Aboriginal. The two men sat up late most nights, surrounded by Gillen's anthropological curios and by all accounts drinking a lot of whiskey. By the time they parted, their respect for each other and their friendship were cemented. Every evening during my stay at Alice Springs, Gillen and myself talked natives. It was quite clear that we were then only on the very threshold of the inquiry, and so we decided to set to work together. Gillen was brim full of enthusiasm. Neither of us then thought that in the course of the next few years we should have the opportunity of living amongst the natives on the most intimate terms, month after month. Not only the Aranda, with whom we began our work, but later on amongst the tribes right through to the Gulf of Carpentaria. It was Gillen's status as an initiated member of the Aranda that enabled both men to enter the secret and sacred world of Aboriginal life. They were to witness scenes that no white man had ever seen. Spencer came to realise that Aboriginal ideas about this sacred world were often expressed in their painting. The men to be decorated sit down or often lie at full length on the ground. 
The decorator makes a little brush made out of a small twig, frayed so as to make a little disc shaped like a pygmy chimney sweeper's brush. He holds the brush in his hand and draws his design just like an expert artist. Clear evidence of the presence of natives was afforded in the shape of numerous drawings made on the walls of shallow caves around the base of the rock. The natives evidently appreciated them as much as we did. Wherever there was a flat rock surface, there we found traces of them in the nature of quaint drawings done in red and yellow ochre, charcoal and white pipe clay. And some were what may be called geometrical in nature, consisting of concentric circles, curved lines and dots. Now, rock paintings like these weren't made by a culture that had vanished, and Spencer knew it. They'd been painted by the Aborigines who were still living here in central Australia. Each of them had a specific meaning, as indeed do these rocks. For the Aborigines, they weren't just another geographical feature. They were an important sacred site. And that highlights a difference in the way that the two cultures thought of this land, which they both saw as their own. For the scientist, this was an uncharted expanse of geographical space. For the Aboriginal, this was more than just land which provided food and shelter. Sacred sites like this actually contained their history. And it was through the legends associated with these sites that Aborigines did, and still do, understand their origins and their existence. Dog dreaming. Dog dreaming? Yeah. Coming down here? An Arunda like Wenton Rabunja knows the landscape around Alice Springs in intimate detail. And then this is your but each down. rock, tree, hill and gorge is not just a familiar feature. Some of these are also charged with a spiritual force. These are the sacred sites. Their significance was acquired in a strange epoch known as the dream time. It began in the distant past and explains how people and things came to be as they are today. So the, the ceremony and the landscape is, is all close together? All close together, one, one, one body in, in one land. Well, to really explain what the dreaming track is, and the dream time, it's a story that's been passed on from generation to generation. And when it's passed on, the young man get initiated. Then he is taught all those things. And he's taken along that track and to various places where this um, certain dreaming thing stopped. All the man made camps or wherever he stopped and wherever he disappeared underground. So it's still a song and he's taken all the way along the line and showing that area. And then he does the same thing with his son in the future. From the whites, point of view, looking at the land is they just want to make money. We're Aboriginals. Look and preserve their dreamings, sacred sites and their songs. Could be a tree, could be a rock. And it could go from place to another place where you go from one area to another. Another tribe takes it on. Same dream all the way along the line. That's uh, Emily Cap and this is uh, uh, Jesse Cap and there's a uh, Cap. So these are all geographical places yeah, here. Yeah. What what do these symbols mean? Uh, those uh, young men, young men uh, traveling from Augusta. They, uh, are they Aranda men? Mm. They make, uh, come from uh, their language and then they turn into a uh, another another lingo. Then they come to a Lurija, talk a Lurija, then Pijanjara, or Aranda, and then the next Lara Aranda, and Sandla Aranda, all change. Because it's one line, a Churung we call them, dreaming. Even today, if certain symbols and designs are disclosed, there are serious repercussions. Same with this, or they'll kill them. Oh, they'll say, uh, you're causing trouble for all your family. 
all his family from mother's father to mother's mother to father's father father's mothers yes yeah this is very uh, and it's very danger yet though his life is one continual struggle against adverse conditions he has no desire whatever to leave the land wretched and sterile though it be which his ancestors inhabited every natural feature is associated in his mind with some ancestor who not only wandered over the country but actually created the sand hills rocks and trees which now exist the way from them he would be miserable the sentiments that surround dreamtime today are as strong as those that spencer noted 100 years ago Spencer's notebook was crammed with anthropological information, mostly based on Gillan's first-hand knowledge of the people he had cared about and befriended so well. The partnership of Spencer and Gillan was launched, and anthropology was to be drastically changed. The group responsible for the beginning of that change was what Gillan called his mob, the Aranda. Spencer and Gillan's work on the native tribes of Central Australia didn't fall on deaf ears. Probably the most significant impact that it had was on a man who taught Greek and Latin here at Trinity College in Cambridge. His name was Sir James Fraser and he wasn't just a classical scholar. He had published probably the most popular book on anthropology ever written, The Golden Bough. It went into several editions. The reason that he first decided to rewrite it was because of the body of facts that Spencer and Gillan had produced. but his enthusiasm for their work didn't end there he and several other scholars and dignitaries in england got together a petition to the australian government to enable spencer and gillan to take a year out of their jobs and make another expedition deeper into aboriginal australia On his return from Central Australia, Walter Baldwin Spencer wrote a series of popular books on his experiences. A wide public all over the English-speaking world read in unusually accurate detail of the daily lives of the people he'd grown so attached to, even though he, like other people of his day, called them savages. These Aborigines are the Wurrumungu, and their ancestors were among those tribes that Spencer and Gillan studied next. Perhaps the point of most importance in regard to the Aboriginal is that he is a pure nomad with no fixed abode. There is no such thing as any village or compound in which the natives live permanently in association with one another. At most, they have favourite camping grounds where, under ordinary circumstances, they build rough bark or bough shelters. At night time, the whole family huddles together along with dogs. and with perhaps two or three small fires very close to them the native firmly believes in a small fire that he can get near to even perhaps coil round and that can be easily replenished with small sticks today the wurrumungu like most aboriginal peoples are no longer strictly nomads and those bark shelters have become more permanent bases but as in spencer and gillan's day 
Homesteads are not as important as their attachment to the land itself. Before Spencer and Gillen, uh, anthropology was to some extent anecdotal. Uh, it was also connected with supposed atrocities in which there were contacts or excuses for elimination of the Aborigines uh, for certain areas because they were interfering with cattle or with sheep or with uh, or even as an occasion in South Australia the actual bur murdering of uh, white people but everywhere there was a sort of fear that oh these people were more or less derelicts that were going to disappear very shortly and it was really not until uh, the, the time of Baldwin Spencer and of course the Horn Expedition who thought that the, the information about these uh, dying people should be put, put on record. The Wurrumungu have worked on cattle stations for a generation and they are expert stockmen. Before white people come to this land say Aboriginal land, Aborigines had different idea, you know, was living on his own land. And then when the white fellow come to this country, when they got the Aborigine to go and work for them, they got a different idea from white fellas. You know, they've been taught their way from Aboriginal way, they come to come and work the way they wanted to. While Spencer and Gillen were discovering the charm and sophistication of Aboriginal thought and custom, the rest of the population had a very different view of the place of blacks in the Commonwealth of Australia. Aborigines were baffled into submission. Why should white man's law apply to them? They had their own law. There can't be many happy memories surrounding this building which stands in the middle of modern Alice Springs. It's the old Stuart Town Jail. There's no exact record of how many Aborigines were ever incarcerated here, but as sub-protector of the Aborigines, Gillen won the special support of those people by numerous acts of kindness one of which was to make sure that when they broke the white man's law, they had a fair trial. But in 1891, he won a special place in their hearts and in their history for bringing to trial a notorious local policeman called Mounted Constable Wilshire for murdering several local Aborigines. It wasn't the first nor indeed the last massacre of blacks by whites. Indeed, there were killings on both sides. But it clinched Gillen's reputation as the most liberal man in central Australia for bringing to trial a man whose acts of genocide were largely approved by the local white population. After the success of the book they had jointly written on Aboriginal life, Gillen suggested to Spencer a further expedition. Both men were now respected authorities on Aboriginal life, but there was no real systematic knowledge of the tribes to the north, and as they felt sure that Aboriginal life was soon to disappear forever, both men were intrigued to know more. There were other reasons why an expedition was a good idea. Both Spencer and Gillen loved the Australian outback, and they really enjoyed each other's company. They depended for their transport on horses. They brought along 20, both to ride and to pull their supplies. They gave the senior anthropologists of the day the dubious honour of having horses named after them. There were Fison and Howitt, the two senior Australian Aboriginal specialists. And then there were the two British anthropologists, Tyler, who'd taught Spencer at Oxford, and their mentor, Sir James Fraser. They travelled north along the telegraph line, using these stations as staging posts for their supplies and as bases to make excursions into previously unrecorded Aboriginal territory. Though our travels have led us across some of the wildest parts of Australia, we have no thrilling tales of adventure to tell. In fact, from this point of view, we ourselves have had nothing but the most commonplace and prosaic experiences. 
We have, however, seen many things that the ordinary white man does not have the chance of seeing, and some, indeed, that no white men, save ourselves, have ever seen or are likely to see. Because the Australian Aborigine is intensely secretive in regard to his most sacred customs and beliefs. And unless one is regarded as an initiated member of the tribe, one may live amongst them for a lifetime, as many white men have done, and yet know nothing whatever of these things. When we were traversing the continent in 1901 and 1902, the fact that we were thus regarded as initiated members of the Aranda tribe was of the greatest help to us, serving as a passport from one tribe to another. Theirs was the most ambitious fieldwork yet attempted in Australia. For apart from the scope of the project itself, the researchers intended to capture native life using the most up-to-date methods. They made wax cylinder recordings of Aboriginal stories, music and songs, and also took some of the earliest cine films of the elaborate ritual that surrounded Aboriginal ceremonies. It takes a good deal to astonish a savage. He is brought up on magic, and things that strike us with astonishment he regards as simply the exhibition of magic of greater power than any possessed by himself. He therefore seldom exhibits any great surprise. But on this occasion, the natives were certainly astounded, and their general opinion in regard to the phonograph was that there was an evil spirit in the box which caught hold of their voices and could send them out again. Today, the Wurrumungu still perform their ceremonies along traditional lines, just as Spencer and Gillen witnessed. Even the body paint goes on in the same way. The importance and interest of these ceremonies lie in the fact that they constitute, amongst savages who are far below the grade of having acquired even the simplest form of written language, a record or at least a supposed one, of the past history of the race as represented in the doings of its ancestors. Unfortunately, we did not keep a quite complete list of these, but for three months never a day passed without one of them, and sometimes there were as many as six during the 24 hours. Each ceremony further was associated with some old totemic ancestor who was specially connected with the given locality. Every ceremony was also regarded as the property of some individual who had received it by inheritance, usually from his father, but sometimes from his father's brother if the latter had no actual son. The possession of ceremonies such as these is a source of profit as well as pleasure to the older men. <laughs> The elders passed on their ritual secrets to their newly initiated men and women through these ceremonies. But they were unaware of how their confidence, Spencer and Gillen, were going to use this potent knowledge. Spencer and Gillen come to Nen Creek. I showed them a lot of robberies on the Aborigines. It was a long time ago. I think these people didn't know, you know, what they was given away with that robbery, they really didn't know. I reckon they was, you know, my side, they were done wrong, you know, just because they didn't know, they didn't remember. That's how these people kept everything away. Any sacred things, I think they were shown most there sacred sites too, you know, but they didn't know what could happen. Spencer and Gillen collected information regardless of its sacred or secular nature. 
They saw everything as important, so the everyday side of life was documented as well. For example, things like how different tribes went after their game, what people looked like, and a highly developed way of communicating without uttering a sound. Might say kangaroo. Stay there. He said the kangaroo there. You what pointing at kangaroo? And you say kangaroo there. Keep quiet. You wipe with your finger dog. That's a finger dog. Finger talk fascinated Spencer and he recorded a large vocabulary of signs. Here was a sophisticated way of sending information whilst out on the hunt. Mm. <laughs> yeah. What happens? I wonder, one old lady, she's in now, Nora Dickey there, old Nelly. So she was saying, oh, you eat too much, no good, we better pull your teeth. So we cut them stick, but that long. We put them in the fire. Sharp them and put them in the fire, then start to uh, hit them with a stone. I was wondering what would be done with the tooth. In the Waramunga, its fate is a curious one. If it be a woman's tooth, it is taken back to the camp, where it is pounded up between two stones, mixed with a little meat, and then eaten by the girl's mother. If it be a man's tooth, its fate is still more curious. It is pounded up and must be eaten by his mother-in-law, which perhaps is the strangest use for a mother-in-law that any Australian tribe has devised. The ingenuity with which Aborigines lived off what most Europeans considered a barren land was of special interest. Of course, plants and animals were exploited, but so too was the insect life. Items like the highly nutritious wichity grub. That's where you put them if you get other insects provided food as well. Species like the honey ants that lived all over the desert scrub, and that favourite of human societies all over the world, honey. It's known to the Aboriginals as the sugar bag and is produced by a species of bee that doesn't sting. The whereabouts of the honey bag is determined in different ways. The simplest is that of coming by chance across a tree where the bees can be seen flying in and out of the nest. Another that I often saw them using was to place the ear on the trunk or bough of a likely looking gum tree, when if it contained a nest, the low hum of the bees at work could be heard. When once the honey bag had been located, it is chopped out. The whole mass is scooped into a piece of bark. Hundreds of bees get mixed up with the pollen and honey, but the natives do not mind this and eat the whole of it with relish. So far as the honey itself is concerned, it is excellent. There's an amusing story of how white technology confused the expert Aboriginal naturalists. It was to do with the noise made by the telegraph wires. Well, telegraph line, it was timber, wood. All days, they have been come along you know, legend. Well, uh, even we're going to sugar bag with there. He had to cut him down, I think. That old people, they made trouble the trouble again. The 1901 expedition was a major landmark in Aboriginal studies. Apart from the rigorous conditions under which they did their research, they extended their picture of Aboriginal life to a whole group of undocumented tribes. 
This information was eventually to change the European idea that Aboriginal life was primitive and simple. Back in southern Australia, they conferred with the two grand old men of Aboriginal studies, Fison and Howitt, before producing their volume on the Aboriginal tribes of the North. Spencer was at the peak of his career, and as an influential public figure with a knowledge about the natives, he was recruited as protector of Aborigines. This meant more trekking, and it was while on government duty away from Melbourne that he heard the sad news of Gillan's death. Spencer wrote to Gillan's widow. I have been thinking very much about our old life when we were working together during the summer months at Alice Springs. Last year and this year I've missed him more than I can say. No one had a better friend and comrade than he was. I look back on his friendship as one of the greatest privileges and blessings of my life. His memory is, and always will be, very dear to me. Spencer's views were advanced for his day, but to us they seemed strongly paternalistic, especially as far as the education of children was concerned. His spell as a government official also seems to have distanced him from his understanding of the importance of traditional ways. It is absolutely essential that all efforts should be directed towards the training of the younger generation. The primary object of all stations must be to train the natives in industrial habits. Until such time as they acquire these habits, there is no chance whatever of raising them from their present condition. Teaching should be of a very simple character. It should include reading, writing, the elements of arithmetic and singing. The latter can be made to be of particular educational value in the training of the Aboriginals, owing to their universal fondness for it. In course of time, each station should possess its own band. Moral training should be given in the schools on the simplest and broadest lines possible. The main training should be work amongst stock for the boys, and domestic work and gardening for the girls. The children must be withdrawn from the native camps at an early age. This will undoubtedly be a difficult matter to accomplish and will involve some amount of hardship so far as the parents are concerned. But if once the children are allowed to reach a certain age and have become accustomed to camp life with its degrading environment and endless roaming about in the bush, it is almost useless to try and reclaim them. On the other hand, if they are once brought at an early age into a station and become accustomed, as they soon do, to station life, then they will gradually lose the longing for a nomad life and will in fact become incapable of securing their living in the bush. Today, Aboriginal peoples all over Australia are trying to regain control of their own destiny. Aborigines are now making sure that their children learn the ideas and values of two cultures. Well, I it is a good thing because now we're living in two kinds of world. Before, Aboriginal people used to live in their own world. But now we've got white Europeans here. And it's good to have kids now and in the future to learn our own culture so they don't forget. Where well, years ago, when we were put in school on reserves and um, from reserves on stations into town on hostels, we were taught this just only the white thing, the white God or white angel or white Jesus or things like that. So, you know, if only people would understand that we want to learn our own things as well, as well as somebody else's. Spencer was also deeply committed to his own culture. And although he was now regarded as a world authority on Aboriginal affairs, in Melbourne he also played an important role in the cultural life of his own adopted country. Apart from being a senior university figure, he was at the same time an art collector, chairman of the Sporting League, a conservationist and director of the National Museum of Victoria. It's here that most of the special items and data that he and Gillan collected have ended up. This is a spear thrower. It's from the Aranda people and it's one of the objects that Spencer collected and gave to this museum. It wasn't only biological specimens that he was rearranging and adding to. When he took over, he realized that the anthropology collection was very small. He got his friends and colleagues all over Australia who were in contact with Aboriginal peoples to send or sell items to the museum for its collection. 
There are, however, some problems with the objects that Spencer collected for this museum. Some of them he fully realised had an important place in Aboriginal ceremonial life, but neither he nor any of the anthropologists of his day fully realised their secret and sacred nature. For Spencer, all knowledge was to be shared. This led him to overlook or neglect the prohibitions that the Aboriginals applied to the secret and sacred side of their lives. Even the notes and diagrams he made may be seen by today's Aboriginals as privileged information. Here's his diary from the Horn expedition. Here's his jottings when he made his second visit to see Gillen up at Alice Springs. Here's the list of artifacts that he and Gillen collected for this museum on the 1901 expedition. And here are his field journals. The journals that he taught all his students to write up from their various jottings every night. They're a fascinating thing to look at. Natural history diagrams and details right alongside the notes he was making about the Aranda and the Wurrumungu and all the tribes he came into contact with. There are also diagrams that he made of the various complex terms for relatives that the Aborigines used. And here are the drawings he made of their finger talk when he was with the Wurrumungu people. All of this data was starting to impress anthropologists back in Europe. They could see that Spencer and Gillen's approach was methodical and scientific. There's a letter here which comes from Sir James Fraser and I think sums up the way that anthropologists in Europe were starting to judge all of this vast body of facts. Spencer had just dedicated his book, The Arunta, to Fraser. Few things in life could give me so much pleasure as such a dedication. So our names will go down, linked together, yours, I am sure, to a distant posterity, and it will carry mine with it. You have opened up, in my opinion, a deeper mine into the past of human institutions than anyone else has ever done. The rest seen by comparison to be scratching the surface. It's signed, always your attached friend and thankful learner, James Fraser. It wasn't only Fraser who was influenced by their work. In France, the great sociologist Emile Durkheim was also to base much of his thinking on Spencer and Gillen's Aboriginal studies. His ideas, in turn, were later to have a profound and lasting impact on anthropology around the world. In Melbourne University, in the department founded by his grandfather, Kingsley Rowan also teaches biology. As a child, I remember that he, my grandfather always seemed to be very certain of what he was doing. His contemporaries say this is what he owed his success to, that he could go straight at a problem quickly, work quickly, write quickly, and was able to carry out so many different functions at the one time for this reason. And we see this trait perhaps among the more successful academics to this day. Spencer was a scholar with an unusual sense of the importance of what he uncovered. He readily made his findings available to other anthropologists, but he also communicated the world of the first Australians in popular books. There are the series of massive books on the subject, and these contain two popular books across Australia and Wanderings in Wild Australia, which are written for the general public, and which book buyers of my parents' generation invariably possessed. My parents-in-law, for instance, had these books, and they were not uh, directly interested in zoology or anthropology, which I think spread interest in his work much wider than it would otherwise have been. By 1929, Spencer was retired from academic life. But he was restless and decided to do new field work in Tierra del Fuego on the tip of South America. He was pursuing evolutionary ideas by once more searching for the origins of the natives. It was to be his last field work. Spencer died in the middle of active research, but knowing that his work with Gillen had changed anthropology. In the words of the leading scholar of the next generation, Bronislav Malinowski, half of the total production in anthropological theory has been based upon their work, 
and nine-tenths affected or modified by it. There's little doubt that as a biologist alone, he would have been one of the more eminent scientists of his generation. But there are two other personalities necessary for Spencer's impact as an anthropologist. These were Sir James Fraser, the armchair theorist back in England, who guided and encouraged the research and whose theories were never contested. And of course, Frank Gillen, that man with a special place in Aboriginal society, who lived close to the people and who had a profound knowledge and respect for them. But it was the theoretical framework under which they organized their facts, which is seen as the major shortcoming of their work today. In spite of Spencer's insight, it was left to others to capitalize on his discovery of just how complex and resilient Aboriginal life really was. He was knowledgeable, enlightened and liberal, but constrained by the prevailing notions of his day. He never really saw Aboriginals other than as a prehistoric race doomed to extinction. That theory of social evolution hasn't survived. It collapsed under the sheer weight of facts that people like Spencer and Gillen were discovering. These weren't early, simple, primitive societies. They were complex, contemporary cultures. Though the facts have been corrected and amplified, their record of ancient living cultures still remains. And so does the method that Spencer and Gillen used to study them. It's an approach that has strongly influenced the way that other cultures have been studied since. It's called fieldwork.